Hello everyone, I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Roy Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Today, we're honored to have a world-renowned medical oncologist who was also recently recognized by Nature Medicine for her ongoing work, Dr. Miriam Shalabi from Amsterdam, to talk us through her work that all of us will be implementing in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, the Niche 2 study. We cannot wait to learn more about this. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Shalabi. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you uh, for this uh, invitation, and it's great to be here. And uh, thank you for highlighting our work. Thank you, Dr. Shalabi. Uh, to begin, can you please walk us through the study design of Niche 2 and its primary and secondary endpoints? Sure. So um, Niche 2 started after we had Niche 1, of course. Uh, we had been seeing responses in MMR-deficient tumors for uh, for quite some time. I had published data, the early results of Niche 1, and then decided that we needed a bigger study uh, using the same regimen because it was working quite well, uh, but a bigger study to be able to also uh, assess disease pre-survival, which is uh, considered the um, uh, well a surrogate endpoint for overall survival uh, in non-metastatic colon cancer. Um, so that's how we design Niche 2, where we treat patients with the same regimen, uh, meaning two cycles of uh, nivolumab, uh, three milligrams per kilogram and one single cycle of ipilimumab uh, low dose, uh, one milligram per kilogram. And patients would undergo surgery within six weeks of registration in the study um, to keep that as short as possible as we had been doing before. Um, and that's actually the design of the, of the trial in terms of uh, the treatment for patients. We did colonoscopies at baseline uh, for baseline biopsies and that's mainly for the translational research work uh, that we would be doing uh, afterwards. Um, and so most patients would be treated within four to five weeks after the first cycle of immunotherapy. And again, Dr. Shulabi, you've mentioned that this is all around MMR deficient patients. How common is MMR deficiency in early colon cancer? Yeah, so in early colon cancer, it's between 10 to 15 percent. Um, it, it differs, varies a bit in the in the numbers, but uh, somewhere around there. When we go to the metastatic disease setting, it's it's much lower. It's about 5 percent. But in the early stage setting, it's quite a lot of patients, uh, With uh, especially if you consider that colorectal cancer is one of the most common cancer types. Um, so it's quite a lot of patients with MMR-deficient tumors when we're testing for it. And I think by now, everybody is... Um, well, is testing for MMR deficiency, I hope, especially when we're considering systemic therapy and systemic treatment for these patients. Absolutely. Thank you. And what did the study show? Yeah, so um, what we did in uh, Niche 2, we wanted to treat more patients. So ultimately, we had, at the time of the ESMO presentation, uh, treated 112 patients uh, with this regimen within uh, Niche 2. Um, and all of the patients were considered for the safety analyses because we had two co-primary endpoints, one of them being uh, safety and uh, feasibility and the other being disease-free survival. And the secondary endpoints included pathologic responses. And at ESMO, we presented one of the co-primary endpoints, which was safety and feasibility. That included all of the 112 patients treated and um, the secondary endpoint of pathologic response that included 107 patients in the efficacy analyses. So if we start with the, with the safety, with the primary endpoint, we considered safety, uh, the, the treatment to be safe and feasible if no more than 5% of patients would have delays in their surgery of more than two weeks. Um, and we, when we analyzed the data, actually treatment was very well tolerated. Um, we only had uh, four patients, so 4% of patients with uh, grade three to four treatment related adverse events. Um, which were all managed uh, um, and also uh, have been resolved. And only two patients had delays in their surgery of more than two weeks. So we met the safety primary endpoint of the study with that. And of course, then the next step is what is it doing? Is it working? Uh, and how well is it working? And well, that that is, uh, um, of course, the well, I still think it's beautiful, the, uh, the waterfall plot that we showed at ESMO. Um, it's been given a lot of names. Um, I still call it the uh, the waterfall plot. But um, so it's uh, 107 patients uh, that we're looking at here. Every one of these bars uh, portrays one one of these patients. And what you can see here is that all of this is uh, going way down, meaning that we had um, pathologic tumor regression of almost or 100%, so pathologic complete response or near complete response um, in most of these patients. 
So if in terms of numbers, we had 95% of patients with a major pathologic response, which meant that patients had 10% or less residual viable tumor. And that's both in the primary tumor and in the lymph nodes. We consider those together for a pathologic response assessment. And we had 67% of patients with pathologic complete responses. Um, so both in the primary tumor and the lymph nodes. There were four patients with pathologic partial responses, uh, which is then uh, between 50 and 90% um, uh, viable tumor um, re uh, regression, tumor regression, uh, and uh, only one non-responder. Um, and that was one patient with 40% uh, residual viable tumor. So dramatic responses um, in a very short treatment period of uh, uh, five and a half weeks, uh, median uh, from time of first nivolumab, ipilimumab to surgery in these patients. Um, and not only 99% uh, pathologic response rate, but also 95% uh, major pathologic response rate. So uh, these are uh, wonderful data for the patients, of course, because these were patients with very high-risk tumors, um, more than 60% of patients had T4 tumors that were barely resectable, where induction treatment was advisable um, and also, uh, well, um, deemed necessary by the surgeons. So in that sense, uh, we're providing patients opportunity to undergo their surgery, and uh, also all patients had um, tumor-free resection margins. Uh, when you consider that most of these were ugly T4 tumors, then uh, that's also a wonderful result. Um, and the treatment, as I said before, was very well tolerated. And also importantly, so we don't have the disease-free survival data yet, um, the median three-year DFS data, uh, but with the follow-up that we had uh, during ESMO, so that was a median of 13 months, and that varied between one and 54 months, um, none of these patients had recurred. And if you consider that these were mostly high-risk uh, tumors, you would expect about well, at least 15% recurrence in the, especially the high-risk tumors. Um, so we hope and uh, um, that this is going to stay uh, like this and that we're going to be able to show that um, these patients have uh, um, have wonderful prognosis after this neo treatment. Wow, this is amazing. Blows away one's mind every time one looks at this plot. Congratulations on how famously now known as Shalabi plot. Thank you. And to compare with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, where we see less than 10% PAT-CR in this patient population, just diving a bit deeper now, did the study show any key differences in Lynch and non-Lynch associated tumors? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So uh, we uh, indeed looked at uh, Lynch versus non-Lynch associated tumors. We had 31 patients with uh, um, with known uh, Lynch syndrome um, as an underlying cause of their DMMR tumor. And what we saw is that there seemed to be a, a higher pathologic complete response rate in the um, patients with Lynch-associated tumors. So, of course, we saw responses in both, uh, both groups, and uh, they were equally wonderful, uh, but they're did seem to be a higher PCR rate in, uh, um, in the Lynch-associated tumors. Um, so we know that the non-Lynch-associated tumors um, often have BRAF mutations. We don't know that on all of our patients uh, because we're currently doing these uh, DNA sequencing analyses. Uh, well, could that be maybe a reason why they um, tend to respond maybe less quickly to ultimately achieve a BCR? Maybe that's one of the drivers there, uh, but yeah, those are things that we're going to be looking into um, in the very near future, and hopefully uh, we can connect on that in the um, in the near future. Yeah, it'll be interesting on uh, what the results show for future as well. Uh, this was a bigger study, but we saw similar results for rectal cancer at ASCO 2022. Yeah. Do you think we can start hoping for surgery-free options for some of these patients and perhaps employ ctDNA? Uh, to monitor closely after they have had IO up front? Uh, great question. I think 2022 was a fantastic year for patients with uh, early stage DMMR tumors with the uh, rectal cancer study by Sursek and colleagues showing fantastic responses to uh, um, anti-PD-1 monotherapy and this organ sparing approach for all of those patients. I think that's wonderful, especially for morbid surgeries that patients have to undergo otherwise. Um, and with the data that we're seeing in, uh, in Niche 2, I think that's, uh, that's a very logical next step to consider. 
Um, well, what we did is show at ASCO, uh, but we did actually publish some of the work uh, previously, is that it's quite difficult to assess uh, radiologic responses, especially when you're uh, treating um, uh, with a very short duration of, uh, of I.O. Nonetheless, I think ctDNA is a very interesting one and definitely one that we're um, looking into. So. Um, we're now um, currently starting analyses for ctDNA niche 2, uh, where we hope to see uh, how the dynamics of ctDNA are during treatment, prior to surgery, and also after surgery. Oh. Um, and hopefully we can use that in the future, together with radiologic assessment um, and maybe endoscopic assessment as well, to, to ultimately decide whether a patient can undergo um, or shouldn't undergo surgery and that we can, uh, we can uh, watch and wait. So we have a study now that's ongoing, and uh, um, that's for the locally advanced and irresectable um, DMR tumors, where in, in the U.S. it's a common practice to give those patients uh, um, uh, pembrolizumab uh, in the first-line setting, and you have uh, more treatments than we do in Europe. But that is actually not, um, not the case in Europe, um, because... Well, the study, the Kino 177, didn't include that patient population. So we're not allowed, we're not able to give that patient population immunotherapy unless they have metastatic disease. So we designed this study especially for that reason. We give them from um, uh, in the same way that you would uh, with metastatic disease. But what we're doing in that study is doing also endoscopic assessments and ctDNA and also, um, of course, radiologic assessment. Um, and hoping that that may help also to shape the future organ sparing approaches uh, for a new adjuvant and dual checkpoint blockade as well in, in DMMR colon cancers. Dr. Shalabi, you've mentioned use of pembrolizumab or a single agent um, IO in metastatic disease. In mm -hmm. this study, the combination was uh, PDL1 inhibitor with CTLA4. Do you think you would have seen similar results with a single agent PDL1 inhibitor? And how much is CTLA4 really adding here? Um, that's a good question. I don't have an answer. I do have, um, I can speculate, of course. Um, if we look at the SIRSEC study um, at the three-month mark, they still couldn't tell which patients had a, um, had a complete response, a clinical complete response. Um, and I think that has to do with how quickly you get a response with dual checkpoint blockade versus a monotherapy. I think six months of treatment is quite long for the neoadjuvant setting, but it's monotherapy. So... Um, you win some, but then you, you lose also time. Um, on the other hand, uh, dual checkpoint blockade, well, what we're doing here with nivolumab, ipilimumab is, is just two cycles and you get these responses. And uh, I, I believe that the 95% MPR, the 28% of patients that don't have a, a PCR but do have an MPR, um, it's mostly one or two or three percent of tumor rest. Um, so I think that probably if we would have waited a bit longer in those patients, we would have had a PCR as well. Um, so yeah, w what is anti-CTLA-4 adding? I think it's giving quicker responses um, and maybe deeper responses in that first, uh, uh, first couple of months um, of treatment. Um, but I think that the monotherapy data are, are also very intriguing. Ideally, we would have um, some data on who to treat with monotherapy uh, and, uh, and and whom, wh which patient population that suffices and uh, who you need to give dual checkpoint blockade in. But it's a million dollar question at this time, but I'm sure that we're going to be a answering that in the near future as well. Thank you for addressing that. Given such compelling data, as we wait for other disease sites to follow suit, would you consider the same approach in a patient outside a clinical trial? for let's say upper GI cancer or even from other disease site with MMR deficit, say? Uh, you have all these great questions um, that are very, uh, uh, very timely. Um, well, uh, let me start by saying I, I also agree with you and hope that we're going to see more of these data. And I think that's definitely going to happen. I think that this, uh, the interest has been sparked in uh, both investigators and pharma for studies in MMR deficient tumors of all um, uh, tumor sites, 
Um, and we're working on that. I know many other people are. So, for example, if we look at uh, gastric and gastroesophageal, um, there is the neonipiga study uh, showing 60% uh, PCR in patients uh, um, treated with neoadjuvant nivolumab and ipilimumab. We're going to be seeing some data to ASCO GI also with neoadjuvant um, uh, combination treatment in the uh, uh, DMMR patients with upper GI tumors. Um, so there's more evidence and it's mounting up. Um, would I give that outside of a clinical trial? Um, I'm European, so I think um, <laughs> we're, uh, um, maybe that helps to answer. Um, I can definitely understand why we would consider that. Um, if I had the possibility to do that, um, I would definitely try to get that for my patients. Um, but I think w what I'm focusing on now is trying to have a neoadjuvant study for all patients with DMMR tumors. Um, so, yeah. yeah. As a general medical oncologist, this is what we struggle with day in, day out. So thank you so much for addressing that. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. I, uh, I love this question and these questions, all, all of them. <laughs> Talking about extrapolating data based on the current data available. What would be your adjuvant treatment for someone who's stage three colon cancer with MMR deficiency and has undergone surgery? And who hasn't undergone, undergone neoadjuvant treatment, you mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So at this time, um, if we have uh, those patients, uh, which we rarely have nowadays because they're all treated uh, neoadjuvantly, but... Um, I would still consider the standard of care. We have no data on adjuvant treatment, and um, that data is coming. Um, and um, I think, uh, well, we should be expecting some data quite soon because uh, um, one study, but that's uh, combining um, immunotherapy with uh, with chemotherapy um, that just uh, finished enrolling, if I understood correctly. Um, yeah, at this time, so the short que short answer would be I would still give standard of care adjuvant chemotherapy because we have no evidence for anything else at this time. But I hope that that evidence is going to come. And, well, I do hope that we're going to end up, if we have to give adjuvant treatment, uh, to do that without the chemo. Because I think, you know, looking at this plot we're seeing here, um, you don't want to be treating this, these patients with chemotherapy, and uh, most of them don't need, actually almost none of them needs uh, uh, chemotherapy. Um, so there were just a few patients with, uh, uh, with lymph node uh, positive disease in niche 2 uh, after this neoadjuvant treatment, and some of them underwent adjuvant chemotherapy because, you know, that's considered the standard of care, but most of these patients don't need it. And I think we need to go towards um, de-escalation of chemotherapy instead of adding on to chemotherapy. Certainly very exciting. To summarize, I'm going to quote you, behind every one of these bars in this plot, there is a patient, and I believe many are cured. Dr. Shalabi, thank you for being with us today, and congratulations for such incredible study. Thank you so much for having me. It's been uh, great talking to you.